So these are some pictures that I took of uh, Jupiter uh, last year. These are probably the, the, the best, at least the one on the left is probably the, the best one that I caught during the uh, 2011 go around. And I haven't really gotten uh, much so far because Jupiter is just kind of climbing out of the trees from my imaging site back home in Vienna. Uh, so I, I don't have anything that would quite match up to this just yet. Uh, although it's, it's getting better every day. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do here is this, this is a demonstrate that I actually can take images and, and can take some pretty images every now and then. Um, although I guess this would probably be a little bit better in, a, in an actual dark, uh, dark room. Um, if you look at them on my website, they're, they're, they're better there. Uh, but this is yeah, to, to demonstrate that I actually can take images. Um, but the, as I pointed out in the uh, uh, presentation, I have no technical background whatsoever. Uh, so I, I, whenever I do one of these presentations, I tell people that I really don't know what I'm doing. Uh, and uh, I get uh, nice images every once in a while uh, purely by stubbornness rather than through uh, having any technical expertise or any technical background. So my goal in doing these presentations is that somebody else will hear what I have to say and uh, start to uh, dive into this themselves a little bit and get better at it and then can come back to me and tell me what I'm doing wrong. Uh, and how to make things better. Um, so, which is why uh, I, this is the fourth time I've done one of these presentations on astrophotography, and that's why I've decided to, to start calling them uh, You Suck at Astrophotography, and so do I, uh, because if you're looking for advice from me, you're definitely desperate. Um, so, this is the third volume of the four that I have done. Uh, this is uh, Planetary Imaging Without All the Suffering. Um, was anybody at the uh, NOVAC meeting back in the spring where I talked about uh, Registax and planetary image processing? Okay, well that's, that's true. A couple of you were. I was going to say that's good because then you don't have to forget everything that I told you, but y you should pretty much forget everything I told you. Um, and the reason is that uh, since I gave that talk about Registax, uh, and new software has come along. It's actually been out for a couple of years, but it hasn't been uh, usable for color cameras. And I know that most people who dive into this planetary imaging start out with a color camera. That's, that's what I did. Uh, and this, this software, AutoStackert, would not stack uh, images from color cameras. But as of, I don't know, April, May, something like that, um, the, the guy who uh, developed the software came out with a version that does, uh, planet, does um, color uh, images as well. And it's so much easier to use than Registax. This is why when this guy first came out with this, I said this is the software for beginners to use. And it's not just the software for beginners to use, this is the software that I use now. Because Registax it, it works fine, but it's <coughs> hard and it's complicated and you look at those controls and Half the controls, I never figured out what those things did. Um, so this is, uh, this is uh, pretty much replacing that presentation that I did back in the spring. And we'll walk you from the beginning, which I didn't cover in the spring, I'll walk you through imaging capture uh, and as also through stacking with, uh, with AutoStacker. And we'll talk a little bit about Registax at the end. We do still use Registax to sharpen up our images using a tool called Wavelets. But that's the only thing that I do with Registax anymore. Any, any evidence that AutoStacker is smarter than a user would be at using Registax, or is it just ignore those things and, and you know, it works pretty well? I've, I've asked that question, and my, my experience is that I get slightly better results with, with uh, AutoStacker. Um, and this is particular, particularly most on lunar images. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why, because you would think, you know, we're, we're 10, at least 10 years into the stacking business. And you would think that the optimal algorithms would have long ago been defined and everybody would use, be using the same ones, but that's clearly not the case because, and everybody has reported this, that they get different results with AutoStacker and Registax. And virtually everyone now, since Registax had a, a, a new release come out in the spring, Virtually everyone now is reporting that they get better results with AutoStacker. Um, the, the guy who writes AutoStacker has a little quote from Damien Peach on his website saying, you know, I will not use anything else anymore. <laughs> so I think most people look at that and think, okay, that, that's good enough for me. Yes, and from my tests, even the best Registax pros can't do better. 
Yeah, I, I, and I, I, I mean, I haven't really specifically asked that question, but when I go and I look at people's websites, the people that I think, you know, those are the best planetary imagers that I know, and they report what software they're using, they're, these days they're using Autostacker. That doesn't mean that, you know, Registax won't be rewritten at some point in the future. The, but the, the, you know, the other thing about uh, Autostacker, and the real reason I started using it is because it is so much easier to use. You, you'll see there's one screen that you look at in Autostacker. Whereas with Registax, you know, there's at least three different screens that you go through. There's a million different buttons. You have to intervene in the process regularly. It really doesn't work in batch mode, meaning that you have to feed one, uh, one AVI at a time into it and, and suffer through the entire process. So whereas this thing, you come in at night, dump all your images into Autostacker and go to bed. And come back in the next morning and all your stacking is done for you. So it's, it's much more convenient. Um, so, but I'm gonna start off with a preview here. Um, the capture program that I use these days is Fire Capture. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about stacking with Autostacker, uh, and I'll show you how to do wavelet sharpening in Registax. Uh, I finish up in Photoshop. I'm not gonna go through Photoshop here because Photoshop is completely different depending on what you do. Uh, and, and it is definitely more complicated. Uh, and every time I think, okay, now I know what to do in Photoshop, then I realize, oh no, wait, I'm doing something wrong and change it again. So that's probably the, the thing you don't want to take any advice from me on right yet. Uh, but these are the four steps that, that I follow. And the, the first three are, are pretty easy right now. Uh, so first, let's talk about Fire Capture. Fire Capture is uh, a program that came out, well, back in 2009, I see. Uh, and uh, I started using it um, back in 2011 or so. I started out with a 2U cam, which is a color uh, webcam. Uh, and then I moved to one of these machine vision cameras, a DMK21, which is a monochrome camera. And yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, and the and fire capture will I use a Flea 3 now, which is a, a, a more advanced uh, machine vision camera. And fire capture will run all of these cameras. It definitely will run the Flea 3. It definitely definitely will run the DMK 21. There's a whole range of other uh, uh, high speed, uh, high frame rate webcams that it'll run. It will run the 2U cams and other webcams. Um, I've never tried it with it though, and there's some statement of it has lower functionality uh, with the, the, the more basic webcams. And, and I have not really explored how low is that functionality. Uh, but Torsten, who wrote this, says that it will work with those cameras. So you know, your best bet is to, if you have one of those cameras, is to just set it up and find out what you get. Uh, but I'm gonna walk you through the, the, the routine that I use and, and how, I, how I set this up. Uh, and I apologize, but I've set this for, uh, the, the, when putting this PowerPoint presentation together, I set this for night vision mode. And I probably should have been thinking that it won't be night when I'll be showing you this. Uh, but these are, these are the, the screens that uh, are set up in, in Fire Capture. I'll walk you through these. So once you've got your webcam connected, this is the main screen here. Uh, and oh, by the way, I will have a handout at the end here that gives you a link not only to the software that I'm going to talk about, but links you to this presentation. I, I posted it on Google Docs online. So you can all actually get the presentation. So you, if you can't see anything because it's a little muddy here, you will definitely be able to see it here. There's, and there's a link on this page. Uh, in fact, why don't I just hand that out and you guys can pass that around now. Uh, so the, the first thing that I'm going to talk about is the, just the basic setup on Fire Capture. Once you've got your camera hooked up, uh, Fire Capture will automatically detect your camera and, and connect to it. Uh, and this is the main screen that you come to. Um, the, you'll see it will it, it'll automatically start showing a live feed from your webcam. Uh, and there are a few settings that you want to walk through here to make sure that you've got everything right. Mostly it'll set everything up for you. Uh, the two main settings are up here at the top, which are the gain and the histogram. Uh, or Sorry, the gain and the exposure. So this will depend on what planet you're imaging, how big your, your image is, what your sky conditions are. And th so these are things that you'll have to vary. 
Um, I mean, I can tell you that I shoot uh, Jupiter with a C11 at uh, either F24 or F32. Uh, and I'm in red and green, I'm getting 60, 70 frames per second. This is with my FLEA 3. But of course, this will be totally different depending on what camera you've got connected to it, what your focal length is, uh, to some extent what the sky conditions are. Uh, so, so like, <laughs> I can tell you that the reason that I chose 70 frames per second as my frame rate uh, for Jupiter is because I asked other people what they were doing. And that seemed to work really well. So that's how I chose that. Uh, blue, because the, the cameras are less sensitive in blue, it, in, in blue I'm imaging at about 40 frames per second on Jupiter. Uh, but on the other hand, again, this depends on what planet you're imaging. So I imaged Saturn for the first time in six or eight years. Uh, the other Earth, sorry, not Saturn, Venus, for the first time in six or eight years. Uh, a, a couple weeks ago, and I was getting 160 frames per second. So this is the advantage of one of these machine vision cameras. With my 2U cam, I could get five frames per second. If I wanted to compress it, compress the video and lose some quality, I think you can get up to maybe 20 frames per second. But this 160 frames per second with Venus is uncompressed video, so... What's that? No, it's because, uh, well, there's two reasons. The main reason is just because it's a machine vision camera and high frame rates are what these things are made for. Uh, it's, uh, well, the 2U cam was a USB 1 connection also, whereas the machine visions are, are all USB 2, if, if not USB 3 or Gig E these days. Um, but the other reason is, and this, this is one of the things I wanted to point out, if you want to try and get really high frame rates, um, uh, Fire Capture has a setting here for a region of interest. So this is not, the, the FLEA 3 is a 640 by 480 webcam. And this is, what, 352 by 400, the, the block that I've got here for Jupiter. So if I was trying to run, uh, at least on my computer, if I'm trying to run my FLEA 3 uh, uh, at full, uh, full size, 640 by 480, I can, I think I can get up to 80, 90 frames per second. Down the area right, know. right. So when I was doing Mars, uh, and when, certainly when I was doing Venus, I popped the area down just so it frames around the planet, because seriously, that's all you ever need with Mars and Venus anyway, right? I mean, with Jupiter, maybe you want to bag a moon, right? And it's outside the frame. But with Mars and Venus, that's, this tiny little area is all you ever need. So you can set the region of interest, and this will actually crop the file and you wind up not only with higher frame rates, it's not actually the speed getting from the camera to your computer, it's the write speed of your, of your disk. So if you have a really fast write speed on your disk, you, you may be able to get away with full frame video anyway. Um, but the only place that that would really matter, again, is with Mars and Venus, because with Jupiter or Saturn, they're really not going to be faint enough to support super high speed video anyway. You're going to want to, uh, to expose longer so that, that you get better uh, images. Um, let me go into that now. Uh, if you see, there's some tools over on this side of the screen that fire capture will pop up for you. And one of them that I always turn on is the histogram. And that pops up this box here, which shows you how, uh, how full your, uh, your histogram is. You, you adjust this with the, the gain and the exposure settings here. So the, um, every, every camera will have a different gain setting because I guess it's hardwired into the camera. The um, FLEA 3 will go up to 33 decibels, and for whatever reason, that's, uh, that gets uh, divided by 10. So you can see I've got the slider up about two-thirds of the way here uh, at 24 decibels, which you know, reads out in fire capture as 2.4. Uh, and with the uh, frame rate that I'm using, that you determine the frame rate with your exposure setting. So I've got 14 milliseconds. Uh, and that's giving me a frame rate, frames per second, of uh, 71 here. Uh, and what, what I do is I monkey with the gain and the exposure settings until I fill the histogram to about 80%. Um, you might think, like if you're a deep sky imager, you, you usually say to yourself, well, I want to fill the histogram pretty much as close as I can to the top. 
With planetary imaging, because you're going to be doing a lot of sharpening once this thing goes into your computer, you really don't want to fill the, the you really don't want to have, in, in other words, you don't want to have the image as bright as it can get. Um, because if you do that, you're going to discover once you sharpen it, you're going to start to burn out some of the bright parts of the planet. So I usually fill mine to about 80%. I've heard people say that they fill theirs as low as 60% or even 50%. Uh, particularly as you, you get down onto, uh, uh, to, into blue where the cameras are less sensitive to begin with. Um, but anyway, the, the, the histogram will, will let you keep an eye on what frames, ra frame rates you need to set. Um, you select a filter up here in this box. Uh, I get out of the way here for some of you guys so you can see over my head here. You set the filter up in this box. There's a little drop down arrow there that'll let you pick between the different filters. Yeah, I, so I use, I use a monochrome camera, so I have a color filter wheel set up in front of it. Yeah, okay, okay they, actually that's an excellent point. I have uh, a USB filter wheel, so one of the things I'm going to show you is that Fire Capture will actually run your filter wheel for you. If you have a manual filter wheel, there's a setting that you can adjust that inserts a pause while you flip the filter and then you press a button and it'll take off again and, and then it'll, it'll warn you each time you need to change a filter. Well, there's actually a, a filter, excuse me, a filter wheel set up that we'll, that we'll walk through here. It's one of the, one of the tools that Fire Capture has. Um, so you, what you'll do in this main screen is to set each one of your filters You'll set a separate gain and exposure time for each filter because your camera is going to have different sensitivities. The planet will be, you know, different brightnesses. In short, your, your, blue, your blue exposures are going to suck, but, you know, that's, that's the way it is. Uh, so you'll find that you'll be shooting uh, much less than 70 frames per second on blue. Like I said, on Jupiter, in good conditions, I can usually get about 40. Uh, that was less with my, with my DMK. My DMK was a little less sensitive than the FLEA 3, which is one of the reasons that I upgraded to the FLEA 3. Uh, but what you do is for each filter, you will go and uh, rotate the filter in, see where your histogram is, and then adjust gain and exposure uh, to get the histogram setting and the frame rate that you want for that particular filter. Then you set a time limit on your filters up here. Uh, that's what limit means up here. Uh, I, on Jupiter, I shoot for 60 seconds uh, on, f with each filter. And on Mars and Saturn, I, I would shoot for two minutes on each filter. Uh, th then, you know, go to your green. Again, set, the, set the, the, the time duration that you want. Set your gain and your exposure to, to get your histogram settings where you want. And these settings then are all remembered by Fire Capture, and it will, uh, it will apply them uh, whenever it needs to. Um, one last little thing that you just want to make sure doesn't go wrong, uh, at least on my cameras, uh, Fire Capture, because you can adjust the, gain, uh, the, the gamma setting on those cameras, Fire Capture will open up a gamma box here for you. you always, there's a checkbox there that if you want to mess with the gamma, you can go ahead and check that, and then you can adjust the gamma here. Don't mess with the gamma. Let's let the camera decide what gamma it wants to use, because you can always mess with the gamma later in Photoshop. So make sure that that box is not checked. Also, you can override these frame rate settings here. Uh, if you just set your frame rate by messing with the exposure time, then Fire Capture will run at the maximum uh, frame rate that you can get out of your camera. And that's almost always what you want. I mean, maybe if you're doing solar imaging or lunar imaging, there would be some reason to take fewer frames than, fire cap than your camera makes available. But it, you know, whenever you can, you want to take all the frames that you can get so that you have them. You can toss them out later, but you can't save them if you didn't save them. Um, but if you check this box here, this FPF box, FPS box, then you can manually set the frame rate. Don't do that. Just take all the frames that you can get out of the camera. Uh, the night vision mode, which I have helpfully selected, is up here. Um, you know, in fact, let me just pop this up to make this a little bit easier for you guys to see, because um, Fire Capture, you can actually run it live.
And I'll just run this in the background, and we can pop in and take a look at it every once in a while. Fire Capture, if you want to mess with this indoors, Fire Capture has a, a, a camera, camera simulator in it. So you don't have to use this for the first time out of the telescope. I always love that in software packages. Because I, I don't know about you guys, but I find that my uh, IQ drops by at least 20 points when I'm out there at the, uh, at the telescope. So we're going to tell it that I have a FLEA 3, but it's going to realize that I don't. And that's what it means by, uh, that's what it means by dummy cam. Okay, so we will turn off the night vision mode here. Is that a little better? Okay, so, so now I think you can, you can actually see a little bit better what we're looking at here. Uh, we will run the slideshow there too, just in case. And you have to see if I can easily hop back and forth here. Okay, so there we are. Uh, so th this, is, this is all the screens that you'll see. This, you can see this is the full, full frame here. I, I cropped it a little bit for the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and uh, uh, we're set for Venus here, because that's what, that's what I last imaged. And uh, you, can, you can see all these, these settings here. So make sure that gamma is unchecked. For, for whatever reason, the FPS box is checked here when I'm running with the camera simulator. Don't know why. Uh, your, your tools are over in this area here. Uh, gain and exposure, you'll see that there are little sliders here. You just grab them with your mouse and, and slide them wherever you want. And the, this shows you, this is in milliseconds. So your exposure time right now is 14 milliseconds. And I guess if you do the math for that, you wind up with 71 frames per second at, with 14 millisecond exposures. So you always want to run it as fast as you can. So what we're going to do for the, the rest of this discussion about fire capture is I'm going to talk about the tools that are over in this box here. Uh, we'll talk about uh, filters, automatic running, uh, a whole bunch of little, little devices, auto-guiding. Fire capture will actually auto-guide on a planet for you if your mount is capable of auto-guiding. A whole bunch of uh, very cool tools uh, that you can set up over here to, to make your capture job much easier. Two questions I don't think so far. Um, is the reason that the FPS is less than 71 actually because of memory, memory transfer? Memory? Oh, you mean, or, is what you're talking about the, the fact here that, that, that FPS max as opposed to FPS current? Right. I do not know. Okay. I have tried to figure that one out, but um, the, I, I think actually that there is a tiny little glitch in fire capture. Because you, know, you would think that the, the FPS current would, would match up with FPS max, FPS max because it would compare what you can do, right? right. But Torsten said at one point that um, there's a reason that that number bounces <coughs> back and forth. And my impression was that it was a glitch that he, would, he was planning to fix in one of them. So but would that actually represent <coughs> doing, What's that? It may actually be doing the 71.43, but just not representing it. It may be. I mean, when I've done the math, I, I've, I've only really checked this a few times, but when I've done the math, it's the, it's the setting at the top that, you know, I multiply the, 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 the exposure, the, the length of the video times the, the, the number of frames that are, or divide the length of the video by the number of frames that are in it, and that's what I come up with. So I'm not sure what FPS current really means. You, you know, you would think that it would mean there's some sort of limitation on your system that it's not achieving the maximum rate, but it's close to that anyway. The other question is, is the gain something it's commanding the camera to do in the analog portion before it converts it to a digital image? Or is it something that's being scaled inside? No, it's all in the camera. camera. This it's is in the camera. Yeah, it's not, it's not, in, your, it's not in your computer. Have, have you played around with trading off integration time with gain? To yeah. See what happens with noise? Yeah, a little bit. Although, again, my my systematic approach to this is to ask the people who produce great images and see what they're doing and do what they do. But um, the times that I have checked this out, uh, the, um, I don't really see much trade-off for, for taking lower frame rates. So like, 
I admit that sometimes I could push the push the um, the gain higher. If I push the gain to maximum, I could get more frames per second out of it. And you're right, they would be noisier. And I've never really done a systematic comparison to see what these things are. But I have read some people say uh, uh, now and then that if you drop your gain settings real low and get very low noise uh, images, then you it works out better. I haven't seen anybody say that in a few years because I think it's not true. Uh, it may be true on solar and lunar imaging. I've seen some people on lunar imaging, I've never done solar imaging, but on lunar imaging in particular, I've seen some people who I think produce great images who have said that they drop their gain rates way, way down uh, and uh, uh, will we'll, you know, we'll take those images. But now with lunar imaging, you don't have to worry about your total time because the moon isn't turning, right? Whereas with Jupiter, you really can only go one, in, one minute per color. Theoretically, with Saturn, you're only supposed to go one minute per color too, but I mean, I know the resolution I'm getting out of Saturn isn't, it isn't great enough to, to be limited by that. So on Saturn and Mars, I shoot for two. But on the moon, you could shoot for 20, right? And it may also be as the cameras, as the camera detector chips have improved, the noise in the chip has gone down. I think there's something so to that. That, that. that changes. So it, probably the best setting depends on the camera. Kind of I think that that's right. I think so. If you were shooting with the 2U cam, then maybe you know, reducing the noise levels and controlling the gain would, would be a better idea. But I think with the, uh, with the FLEA 3, I just have not seen any advantage to try and, trying to reduce your noise and, and getting fewer frames. More frames always seems to be the best answer for, uh, uh, for the FLEA 3. And I think that was true with the DMKs as well. Uh, so... The, so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to explain to you some of these tools here. And the tools, there's a, a little box here, a little gear, that, that pops up all your tool settings. Now, why don't we just do this the easy way? And we'll go through Fire Capture, uh, through, the, through the dummy camera. Because I think this will have all the same settings that I need. So the, the first tool that, is, that I'm showing you is just the, the general settings box. Um, there are a couple of things that you want to be sure of here. Uh, uh, but for, for the most part, you'll, you'll see it just gives you uh, uh, the, the standard settings. I don't think I've ever messed with these at all. I, I, I do have the histogram show in a window, um, but you can set that from up here as well, because I always want to know what my histogram is when I'm setting my gain and exposure settings. Uh, otherwise, this thing, that screen is happy. There's really nothing you need to do with it. Uh, this is the capture settings. Uh, and you'll see, the, you'll see there's a series of tabs here, and you're just flipping between them. The, these, these boxes over here match up with these tabs on the top. Uh, in the capture settings, you tell it where you want it to save. Uh, you tell it what kind of things it wants. you wanted to have it code into the file names. Uh, uh, and I guess there's some metadata that you can, you can code in there as well. Um, I always record it with universal time, because that saves me from doing the math later on. Uh, and it'll, so it'll do all these things for you. Uh, it'll record the filter. It knows what object you're on, because uh, uh, up at the top here, you've, you've selected your object. There's a drop-down list there, and you can, you can tell it what planet or moon or solar, uh, or you can, you can edit and come up with your own, uh, your own names as well. Uh, so this is a feature, auto-align. Uh, in practice, what it does is it crops the, the box here for you, uh, and it tries to keep your planet centered in the center of the box. So uh, if you've gone out and done um, uh, long exposure, uh, long focal length imaging of the planets, you know, you'll see that the, 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 the planet is wandering around in your, on your chip, right? And it's nice to have it centered. And what this will do will be it will actually create uh, black background around the planet and will automatically center the planet as it's saving the, the video to your computer. To be honest, I don't really mess with this much uh, because I find that the stacking program that I'm going to tell you about, AutoStacker, it doesn't matter really whether the, the planet is centered. I mean, as long as it doesn't run off the chip, this, this isn't going to save you from that anyway. Uh, but AutoStacker is fine. So the, the, I, I find the planet doesn't really need to be centered. It works fine either way. But the reason I bring this one up is because you see that there's a drop-down box here next to alignment method. 
Um, this is under the, the tab for auto align, but apparently these are the three different techniques for auto guiding that I'm going to talk about next. And the default setting is planets, center, or brightness. That's almost always the, the, the technique that you want to use here. Uh, when fire capture goes to auto guiding, it will actually uh, pick this up for you uh, and uh, uh, will use one of these techniques. Um, there's another one that you can just barely see here called blob detection underneath. Um, Torsten told me the other day that if you are imaging during a brightening sky or you're imaging at, at, at dusk, uh, that the auto guiding starts to get confused. And that's definitely my experience. And we'll start issuing backwards commands and running your planet off the chip. Um, so he has told me that, that blob detection is the, the technique to use at dawn or at dusk. I tried it out and I didn't really see anything, but your mileage may vary. Uh, next screen we're going to talk about uh, is, okay, this is the cool one. This is auto guiding. Torsten added this capability a few months ago, and this is what my, made me finally pony up and offer him some money for, as, for shareware. I've only paid for two shareware packages in my life that I can actually recall. One of them is Fire Capture and the other one is Auto Stacker. Um, but when he added auto guiding capability to this, I just said, okay, I gotta give this guy some money for, the, for this program. Um, what auto guiding does is the, um, here, let's put, a, let's put a planet in the center of the box here so you can get a better look here. Let me stop it. Okay, so what auto guiding will do will be to, um, I don't exactly know how it works. It works by blob detection or center of gravity detection, right? I don't actually know what that means. But um, what it will do uh, will be to issue commands uh, in declination and RA to keep the planet in the, the center of the disk. Um, you know, it's an interesting question whether this will work with altazimuth mounts. I, I assume the answer is no, that you know, just like any auto guiding, it wouldn't, but you know, can't hurt you to try it and see if you've got if you've got an altazimuth mount. Um, but it certainly, if, you probably have to set an orientation of the camera with respect to. That's probably right. I've never tried to but do this. But as it, it, that orientation will change, right? Will be different. But if you set it right to one part of the sky, it should work. Yeah, maybe that's right. Maybe it'll keep you running for for a few for minutes a while, at least. Anyway, until the orientation of the camera with respect to the axis changes. Right. It doesn't change. Right. Yeah, that's, that's an idea. So, I mean, it's, it's worth trying out if you've got an altazimuth mount because, you know, one of the beauties of planetary imaging is you don't need an equatorial mount to do planetary imaging. As long as you, as long as you can track uh, and keep the planet on the chip, you know, you don't need the, the headaches. Um, anyway, so what auto guiding does is you, you, you turn on auto guiding here and uh, you'll, you'll select your mount from a drop down list here. ASCOM is, is what I go through, and then uh, just click this to, to have it connect to your mount. Um, there are a bunch of different settings here that you'll basically just have to play with to see what works on your mount. Um, but the great thing about auto guiding is I set this thing up, at least at night when I was doing Saturn earlier in the year, I set this thing up, uh, I get my filter set up, I set it for auto guiding and I turn it on and I go inside. And I have to come out every once in a while and refocus, but with the next feature I'm gonna show you, uh, this, is, this is the filter wheel control. And what, uh, uh, what fire capture will do, uh, uh, it will actually control your, your filter wheel for you. So if you've got uh, a USB filter wheel, it will rotate the wheel for you. Uh, what you have to do, and let me stay with the, the presentation here because I've got to point this stuff out to you guys. Um, what you have to remember, so this is the, this is the filter wheel box here. And you, you, tell it what you, you tell it down here what filters you've got uh, to set it up. Uh, you tell it you've got, if you've got a motorized wheel, you tell it that here. And then again, you'll connect through, through ASCOM and, and initialize your filter wheel. Um, I, let me say, before I forget, both for auto guiding and for your filter wheel, sometimes it doesn't work the first time. 
I don't know why, but there have been you know, many times that I actually have to close the program down and then go back into it, and the second time it always connects. <coughs> it's one of those things where computers ought to be repeatable, but they're not. Um, but anyway, so you'll go in, you'll, you'll tell it what filters you have down here, you'll connect up here. If you've got a motorized wheel, you tell it that here. And then here, in this row, you're telling it what sequence of filters you want it to use. So you tell it, I want to use this RGB sequence. And then you tell it, I want red first, want green second, want blue third. And if you have a manual wheel, what will happen will be that it will actually pause and wait for you. You can insert a delay here. And so it will actually pause, and then you rotate your next wheel into place, and you know, when it, the, the, the number of seconds has passed, it will take off again. And it will actually code your, your color into your, um, uh, your, file sa your file settings. So when you come back and, and look at your computer, you'll see you know, Jupiter red, Jupiter green, Jupiter blue, and there will be a time coded into those files too. And so when you, when you come back to this thing later on, all those files will be set up for you. You won't have to you know, remember which was which. Um, but if you have a USB filter wheel, or any, maybe there's another way of motorizing a wheel, I don't know. Um, if you have a wheel that it can control and rotate the filters for you, it'll go ahead and do that for you. So I tell it, just to have the scope settle down, I, I insert a three second delay in between filter changes. Um, you have to tell it, uh, uh, you have to put a time limit on it for each filter, obviously, otherwise it's going to run forever. Uh, you, for, so each filter I've set for 60 seconds, uh, and then I just press the start button, and Fire Capture will take 60 seconds on red, then it'll pause for three seconds while it's rotating the wheel, then it'll take 60 seconds on green, rotate the wheel again, and then take 60 seconds on blue. Then, if you, and it's auto-guiding during this whole time, so it's keeping the, 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 the planet centered on your chip for you. Uh, then the next cool thing that Fire Capture will do uh, will be, let's make sure I'm not getting out of order here, It'll be auto-run. And there's really nothing to see here, so I'll stay with this. Auto-run, th this box up here, uh, it'll go ahead and take one series for you every, so I've set this up to run once every 10 minutes. And I've set it to run, what, six, eight sequences? Eight sequences. So what it's going to do is it's going to take, as soon as you press the start button, it's going to take your first series of exposures. It'll take you know, red, red video, green video, blue video, save those, stop for the next 10 minutes, but it'll keep auto-guiding on the planet to keep the planet on the chip. Then 10 minutes from now, it'll wake up again, take another set of RGB images for you, go back to sleep for another 10 minutes. And as long as you think that you can keep the planet in focus, you can let Fire Capture run. So this is the, one of the really great things that I like about this program, that now, just like for deep sky imaging, where I've got auto-guiding going and I've got filter, uh, filter changes set up, I can go to sleep. I, I can't go to sleep with Fire Capture because I know that an hour from now, Jupiter is no longer going to be in focus, right? So I still got to stay awake. But you know, I can go inside, do whatever I, do whatever I want, you know, tend to my children, let them know that I'm still their father, uh, any of that kind of stuff, and um, it will uh, keep running. So this is the great thing. You no longer have to sit out there in the cold, in the snow, with the mosquitoes after you in the summer, anything like that. Uh, it will all take care of this itself. Uh, I should say that I use a, another freeware program called TeamViewer uh, that runs through my Wi-Fi, which is Easy to set up. If I'm a lawyer, if I can set any of this stuff up, you guys can definitely do all this stuff. Um, I use this, this uh, software called TeamViewer that sits on uh, my laptop and on my uh, uh, desktop inside the house and runs through the Wi-Fi router that reaches out to the, to the scope. And as long as I keep an eye on this thing with TeamViewer, it's showing me, this, it's showing me the capture screen from fire capture. So if something has gone wrong, I'm inside the house and I know it. I don't have to sit there and babysit the scope all night long. So the great deal. A lot of this stuff can be done automatically. Um, the last thing that I'm trying to persuade Torsten to add to this is uh, a uh, uh, focuser control. So if you have an absolute focuser, it would be able to, and you're changing filters, and you need to put in an offset for focusing, it would be able to automatically do that for you. 
uh, uh, maybe even temperature compensation if your focus shifts during the night as temperatures, temperatures change. Maybe you can program, program that in. He hasn't added that capability, but that's really kind of the, the last thing left to, to make fire capture you know, the, the total equivalent of you know, maxim DL for, uh, for planetary imaging. Uh, so that brings us to stacking. So you've gone through your whole set of images and you've let fire capture run uh, until Jupiter dropped into the trees for you and now you've got, you know, what, 100 gigabytes of, of AVIs sitting on your uh, machine uh, that are all screaming out at you to manually process them one at a time. Uh, so the guy who wrote uh, AutoStacker, uh, and again, just like fire capture, this program is probably only a couple years old, uh, the guy who wrote Autostacker at Emil uh, said to himself a couple years ago, there is not enough time left in the universe for me to process all the AVIs that I'm chugging out of fire capture. Uh, because in the Registax days, you have to run through one AVI at a time. You put one AVI into Registax, wait four, five, six minutes for it to crush that one into a stack of images. If you want to tweak that, run it again. And each AVI would have to go in there. In theory, there's a batch mode in Registax, but I've never been able to get it to work. It, 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 even, even the times that I have been able to get it to work, it's not user friendly, it's glitchy, and it requires a lot of manual in intervention. Autostacker is really, really simple. That's the entire screen for Autostacker. Those are all the settings that you will need to, to, to set. Whereas, we'll, I'll show you Registax in a few minutes when we talk about sharpening, and I'm only showing you one of the three main screens for Registax. This is just covered with controls that you need to adjust. Um, anyway, AutoStacker is very, very user friendly. It runs in this batch mode, so at the end, end of the night or the next morning, you dump all the AVIs into it that you've got, and you tell it, crunch them all, I'll come back later. Um, it's fast. I find it much, much faster than Registax. And again, that's one of those things that makes you scratch your head because we've been stacking planetary images for 10, 15 years now, and you would think it would be really clear how these things run. But I guess maybe it's, just, maybe it's using the same algorithms, just the, the coding is optimized in one way or the other, that AutoStacker just runs much faster. Um, and again, like I said, I get slightly better results out of AutoStacker, and I always have. This is noticeable on uh, Jupiter and Mars, but it's particularly noticeable on lunar imaging. And then, again, don't know why, but, but that's the case. Um, the last thing is that, um, how many of you guys have done planetary imaging f with, with video before? So you guys know about stacking. And one of the things that you'll see is that uh, you have a choice of what percentage of your frames you actually want to have stacked into your final image. So I usually find that, that I'm running, well, okay, I used to find with my DMK that I was crunching about 40% of my frames and that's what would go into my final image. With my Flea 3, maybe it's because when I got the Flea 3, we went through a bout of really good seeing and I got really spoiled and I don't really set up anymore and really bad seeing. But uh, with my Flea 3, I find I'm running 60 or even 80% of the frames. Um, but you, the point is you have a choice and with Registax, you have to run each one of those one at a time. You have to run it through and say, okay, stack 20% of my frames, wait for it to do that. Then say, okay, stack 40% of my frames and compare each one of these things. With, with AutoStacker, now I'm jumping ahead here a little bit because this feature actually won't be available uh, t uh, for another couple of weeks. Uh, but Emil said he would put it out as a, as a beta release in a couple of weeks. I have the beta now and I can tell you the beta runs fine. So what I'm talking about is this feature right here. It, it, this, is, this tells you how you want uh, AutoStacker to stack your frames. You know, so you can specify whether you want a TIFF or whether you want a, a PNG file. Um, and you can tell it here what percentage of frames to stack. Now with the version that's on Emil's website right now, you can only set one number here. So you have to tell it, you know, I want it stack 40%, I want to stack 20%, 60, whatever, and it'll only run one at a time. Um, but this is the beta that he's gonna put out in a couple of weeks. 
and you can see you can set it to, to run up to four different um, uh, four different sizes. So what I do, you, and you have two different ways you can do this. You can tell it an absolute number of frames. So if you want to stack, you know, 2,000, 4,000, 6,000 frames, um, I don't usually do that. I use the percentages uh, because I shoot each color at a different frame rate. So I have, uh, particularly on uh, uh, Jupiter and Mars, uh, or, well, sorry, particularly on Saturn, I have way more red and green exposures than I have blue exposures. So that's why I use the percentages. I, I would find on Saturn that I would usually stack about 40% of the frames. And that's a different number if it's you know, blue as opposed to red. So what I do usually is I set 10, 20, 40, and 60% of my frames to stack. And the, the, the reason I said that auto stacker is as easy as one, two, three, four, there are four things that you need to set. Once you've set this, and this will be the same, you, know, you can probably leave this forever until Jupiter goes away again. Um, one is open up your AVIs. You know, select, just, just like with, with any file operation in Windows, you know, select all your AVIs and you can open all of them at the same time. It'll dump them all straight into uh, AutoStacker. It'll pop open your first AVI here, so you'll see one, one random frame from the AVI here. Uh, so step two is you press this Analyze button and it will generate this quality graph. So if you were a real techie, you could probably look at that quality graph and it would tell you important information that you would derive from this. So step three. <laughs> is there anything you can say about that? I mean, I've looked at it too and I go, huh? It's cool. It's really cool. It, I mean, what it's telling you is that Registax had the same feature. It's telling you something about the... Um, the two axes, just to start with. Actually. Yes, it, it's, it's a graph. <laughs> I can definitely tell you that. It has an x-axis and a y-axis too. Um, the the, the y-axis is telling you something about the relative quality. So what the, the, what the jagged line means here is, in short, it's how different each frame is from uh, a reference frame. AutoStacker actually will create a reference frame. It'll take an average of some of your best frames and create a reference frame. And this is one of the reasons that it's better than Registax. Registax, you can do that, but you have to do it manually. And that's one of the reasons you can't run a batch mode in Registax. So is this time and maybe this is quality? Well, what, yeah, this is, this is time. This is the position of, of the frame in your AVI. Okay. And this is, this is two things. It's registration difference, which is this, this jagged line here, which shows you how different any individual frame is from your average frame. The, or, well, sorry, from the reference frame that it's using, which is a good frame. Uh, it's an average of a bunch of good frames. Uh, and this, this line here, this, this slope here, is your quality. So what it's done is it's taken all the frames in your AVI and it's sorted them by quality. Uh, there's some algorithm that tells you which frames are best and which frames are worst. And it takes uh, a certain percentage of the best frames uh, and creates a reference frame from those. And then it runs and compares the app, each frame individually, it compares to the reference frame. And that tells you how different it is. So this is, this is kind of what you like to see. You like to see there's a nice smooth curve that show, and then there's a sudden drop off because you know, you've got some crappy frames in there, right? Where something went wrong. Um, you know, usually seeing was really bad. There was a gust, a bird flew through your frame, anything like that. Um, but you, know, you generally like to see a nice smooth curve here, which shows that you know, as your, uh, you had some high quality ones, then you had some medium quality ones, and then you had a sudden drop off at the end. And with your percentages, what you're doing here is you're telling it, yeah, drop those bad ones at the end. Like take only the first 10%, take the first 20, the first 40, the first 60, and then the bad ones are the ones that don't go into your stack. No, there's, there's nothing that you can adjust in this graph. It's, it's, it's just an analysis. Yeah. In Registrax, I use that to determine what percentage of frames I use. So in Registrax, you actually have some sliders here that you can manually slide down and cut off the ones that are you know, most different from your average frame. Um, you have a slider here that you can manually cut off you know, the, the, the bad ones. 
Registax added a, a control a few releases ago that does some of that for you automatically. But the truth is, and one of the reasons that AML didn't include the, the, the slider over here that allows you to cut off the, the ones that are out of registration is it doesn't make any difference. Well, yeah, but you see what you've done here is, in, in effect, because you're only telling it what percentage of frames to stack, you're only, you only have this slider over here that says, you know, I want to stack 80% or I want to stack 10% and, you know, and cut off all the rest of them. But you no longer have a registration slider that tells you I want to cut out the ones that are most out of registration and keep only the ones that are, that are most like my reference frame, right? But the reason AIM will drop that, and in my personal experience too, is that that slider never made any difference in Registax. And I think it may be because the software really isn't capable of judging the registration difference very accurately. I mean, sure, if it's wildly out of registration, maybe it can, it can detect that. Mm -hmm. But minor differences in registration, really, it, it's just not very accurate on. And the ones that are wildly out of registration, they're almost always winding up down here, right? So, you know, you can see that the peaks of the outer registration graph are, the, or at least the average, is over here rather than down here. These are the ones that are most like the, the, the high quality reference frame. So, AIM will drop that feature, and I never used it in Registax to begin with. I mean, I did at the beginning, but then when somebody said, you know, this doesn't matter, I compared it, and he was right. I mean, I, I just never saw any difference. So, the fact that it's not here in AutoStacker has done nothing whatsoever to, to hinder the, the, the final result. One, one of the thoughts you may have, there's a fundamental difference between doing like Jupiter and doing the moon. In the moon, you have a lot of structure to reference. True. And you can really tell whether two things line up well and whether they line up consistently. On Jupiter, you can't tell as well. Also, depending on the night, let's say with Jupiter, you may get a whole bunch of good pictures such that that blue line is high. Yes. A lot of pictures all contribute to a quality image. And on a bad night, not many images contribute to a good image. So there's still got to be a skill level in judging where to set that percentage. That's right. Depending on what you're looking at. And he probably threw up his hands and said, I can't make it a, a simple slider. Yeah. Well, but I think that... experience, you probably find out how to do it. How you know, it, it may be that there's something coded in here that, that, that also throws out some of the outer registration frames. I, my impression is that, that there's not, well, but yeah, I can't say that for that certain. line goes all the way down, so that's saying, you know, there's some which make absolutely no sense, but they're in the, the batch that you gave me. Yeah. But it's not going to decide. Yeah. It's going to let you decide what percentage of them, and it's trying to judge in order which are the best. Because right. when you do the 10, 20, 30, you're saying 10, 20, 30, 40 percent, starting from the best ones, not yes. just randomly. Yes, like yes, yes, let's hope and, so, yes. And, and as that blue curve changes, it's saying, well, I can't really tell which are the best ones. So I'm going to... Well, it's telling you, it can, tell, it can tell which are the best in terms of quality. So remember, it's making two measurements here. One is the, the absolute quality of any given frame. And the other one is how that frame compares in terms of position being out of, out of, out of alignment with the, the reference frame. But in something smooth like Jupiter without a lot of contrast. It's hard to make that registration The scatter is going to be big because you can't make a good judgment. That's right. If you get a random speckle, if I get two speckles on, on two images, they'll line up very well. Yeah. Maybe, and say, oh, this is a good match. It doesn't know it's noise. Whereas on the moon, you've got shadows. Yeah, that's you've true. Got sharp edges. And if it finds a good correlation, a good match, it has a high confidence that it really is a good match, not right. just better than anything else. Yeah, so you know, that's why I think it's leaving it to your skill. Yeah. To develop some experience with the shape of that blue line and then how you interpret it yeah. as far as cutoffs. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, but I think that the, the, the reason that the, that uh, at least the registration control didn't go in here is that it was the advanced imagers that, that fed back and said the registration difference doesn't seem to be changing anything. Yeah. So, it, it, and, and I'll admit that if you guys, uh, when, when I went back and played with this stuff in Registax and looked at the, the video that it gave you saying, okay, I've now created a video for you and your highest quality frames are in front and your lowest quality frames are in back, 
it's all guesswork. I mean, this is, this is a computer. It's not your eyeball that's looking at this stuff to tell you what's the highest quality and what's the, the best. So you will, looking through the best frames, you'll see plenty of junky ones in there too. And looking through the worst frames, you'll see it's tossing out some good ones. And I'm sure that AutoStacker is the same. But the deal here is, when you've got 10,000 frames to sort through, well, <laughs> you're going to have to take some compromises. So that's what you wind up with. Yeah. If you want to know for sure, you just put 100%. Yes. Yeah, yeah, well, so, but that's, that's the beauty of the setup, that, that AutoStacker will do all this automatically for right. you for whatever percentages you set. But if and you so, want to really see all that, if it is junk, do 100% and see what it includes. That's right, range. that's right. But what I do is, the reason I set four different stack sizes is because then, I'll show, when we get to Registax, to the sharpening phase, I'll show you there's a little feature in Registax that allows you to compare them side by side. Okay. So I open my 10% stack and I use a, a certain sharpening level and I open my 20% stack and it applies the same sharpening. And judging from that, I can very, very quickly tell which videos were good on any given night and are worth actually processing out. Because remember, I'm trying to shoot a video every 10 minutes and I'm not gonna process all of those things. So it'll tell me not only, not only which stack size turned out to be best, you know, whether it was the 10, the 20, the 40, the 60, but then I can also compare the, the, the videos that I took at 820 versus the videos that I took at 830 and 840 and figure out which ones are the best and which ones I'm going to suffer through all the rest of the Photoshop and everything like that. So that, that's, that's the real advantage of having these stack sizes. They become the, good discriminators. Yeah. yeah. And you don't have to sit there one at a time and say, okay, red stacks now create a 20% stack. And no, let's try a 40% stack. Compare them side by side. This way, those stacks, it doesn't know which one's best, but it does know that they're done. You don't have to do it yourself. Now, the boxes on the right, the sub-images that it's correlating? Uh, yeah, the... so what you've done here, that's, so that's step three. You've, you've clicked this Analyze button, and it's just generated the graph for you. And that, you know, to some extent, that will tell you what settings you want to use up here. So if this, it's, and it's this quality curve that you're looking at. You can see here's 50% quality. I don't really know what that number is, how it compares, but on a bad night, this curve is gonna be down low. And so you're probably gonna find that your 10% stack is the one you wanna stick with. On a really good night, like this was a really good night, uh, you can see that it crosses the 50% line way out here at maybe you know, three quarters of the, of the images, right? So that on a really good night, you'll find that 40, 60, even 80% of your frames can be stacked, and, and that gives you the best result. Um, but this third step here is, this is why I'm saying one, two, three. The third step here is to place the alignment points. So you've got your, you've got your image here on the screen, and this is, uh, it's either the first frame or it's just a random frame from one of your ABIs. Uh, and you can either go through and check this manual box, and then you determine what size you want these boxes to be. These are alignment boxes. So, yeah, sorry, let me back up here for a minute. What these boxes do is they will tell uh, AutoStacker, uh, use this particular area in this particular frame both to gauge how much in alignment it is with the reference frame and what the quality of the frame is. Now, it may be that it looks at the entire frame to judge the quality of a frame. Uh, but for these, for these individual boxes, what it's doing for each box is to try, try and line that up on that particular region of the, the, the next frame or of the reference frame. This was um, back in the early days of Registex when you're doing lunar imaging. This was a particularly grueling and agonizing process because back in those days, uh, Registex would look at the entire picture. And so if you're doing lunar imaging, You've got an entire frame that's filled with detail, right? And Registax is looking at the entire picture, and when you process your image, you might realize with a certain set of frames processed a certain way, this part of the image is sharpest. But if I take a different set of frames and I process them a different way, this part of the image is sharpest, or this part. And so what we were doing back in these days was to, to make five, six, seven, eight different images, slice them all up in Photoshop, and take the best ones from each individual frame, 
stitch them back together again in Photoshop. And then finally, after suffering through this for a few years, Registax added this feature called multiple alignment point processing. And what and, and the and auto stacker, as you can see, does the same thing. What it does is it looks at each one of those areas and determines you know, which frames are best for that particular box and how they match up best for that particular box. So you no longer have to go in and slice and dice and, and create your final image. And it only uses the box, the data on that box from that frame because that's where it's sharpest in creating the final images. Yes. Wow. Yes. And then it'll do the same for the box next to it. And you can see the boxes overlap. You want to make the boxes overlap because if they don't, you can wind up literally with a seam in the middle of your picture, right? But so what these, what both Registax and Autostacker do these days is they do all this for you. They'll go and look and you know, slice the image up, pick out the, the, the best parts of each image, and then stitch the image back together. Yeah, mosaic, I guess, is what it's trying to do. That's what, exactly what it's doing, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and as long as you have your boxes overlap, I have, it's been years since I had, they, it, the early versions they did have some problems with seams. But it's been years since I've really had any problems with seams. You may see them more often on lunar imaging, but on planets I haven't seen it in years. I haven't had any trouble with it at all. So the, the um, size of these reference frames, you'll see this alignment point. That's what AP stands for here. You can pick what size you want this box to be. If you've got a, re a really high quality, bright image, pick small boxes. Uh, and and this, is, this, is a, this is a pretty good image here. So pick small boxes and use a lot of them and make sure that they overlap. Uh, and then you will, uh, you'll probably get the best result. If, you've got really, if it was really bad seeing, you know, you, there are cases where you might want to put one, just one alignment box around the entire planet. Um, you can also mess around a little bit here uh, by picking different, uh, different boxes. I, I've really rarely done this, but like if there's a moon off here and you want to put an alignment box on it to see if you can get good detail on that moon, try that too. But, but you know, the short story is you can play with these and, and do it however you want. Or you can just click this button down at the bottom, <laughs> which will... And that's what I do, which will look at the entire disk of the planet, uh, or, or the entire frame if you've got a lunar image in there. And depending on what size box you've told it to use, this, this you have to tell it. You, know, you have to tell it what size alignment box you want to do. But once you've told it that, and you click place alignment points in grid, it, will just, it knows where the planet is, and it'll put alignment points on the disk of the planet. And, you know, 90% of the time I find it's doing at least as good a job as I could possibly do manually. And the only time I try and mess with this is if I've got low quality data. And like I said, I've been a little bit too lazy to bother to image on nights when I'm pretty sure the seeing is lousy. So Can you I don't. Do that reference image, or do you have to do it from uh, No, you, uh, so you can, you do this once. And as long as, so let me back up a little bit as long as you haven't changed your equipment settings during the night, like you haven't used a higher power Barlow or something like that, is, and you haven't, um, you haven't changed the size of the, uh, the, the saved video. So like if you're, if you're shooting the full frame at 640 by 480, and then halfway through the night you think, oh, I could get higher frame rates if I went down to 300 by 400, then you gotta run, these, you gotta run those two separate sets separately. At least I think you do. I've never actually tried it out, but it seemed pretty obvious to me that you would have to do it that way. So that's the only case that you would have to run them separately. Otherwise, the planet is going to be, the, the frame is going to be the same size, and the planet, I mean, you know, sure, your, your blue image might be slightly smaller than your red image, just because, you know, Jupiter fades away at the limb, it's faster in blue, but the, the software is smart enough to know that. And so it's going to use the same set of alignment points for, for each video. So in practice, what it does, what, once you've loaded all these videos in, is it actually runs this analyze step separately for each of your videos. Uh, and then it'll, it'll plop, plop the same set of alignment points down on top of your videos. Uh, or if you're having it do it automatically, it may be that each new video it puts its own set of alignment points down for you. Um, but either way, you know, once you've pressed this fourth step, which is this button stack, you're done. You know, you can, you can go to bed, you can go away for an hour, you know, whatever you want. And when you come back, that's the reason there are no more screens here, that's, that's it. <laughs> that's all you do 
for AutoStacker. You know, open your AVIs, click the Analyze button, set your alignment points, and click Stack, and you're done. And what's the result? A series of so the, the, what you'll get back is when you come back to your computer, you've you've what I've done here is I've I've told it to create different stack sizes, right? Or you could say you know different frame numbers. And what you'll, what you'll find when you come back to your computer is the the folder where you had all your AVIs stored up. Uh, it will have a subfolder uh, uh, beneath each of those uh, where there will be a 40% subfolder, a 20% subfolder, whatever. And in each of those subfolders, you'll have all of your AVI, you'll have the stacked result from all of your AVIs uh, that will be uh, set aside. So all your 40% AVIs will be in uh, one folder, all your 20% stacks will be in another folder. And that way, once you start comparing them to each other, you can quickly flip through and figure out which ones are easiest to use, and wh wh which ones are sharpest, which ones you want to stay with. These are already stacks, so they're not AVIs, they're actual. Yeah, you're, so let's say that you've got one folder that has all your AVIs in it, right? And you've told AutoStacker, take all the AVIs in this folder, and you've dumped them into AutoStacker. What it does is it'll create a, a folder within that folder. There'll be a 20% folder, a 40% folder, and when you look in the 20% the folder, and I wish I had some, but I don't think I have, I think I've sucked them all out of my computer right now. Oh, wait a minute. Let me look real quick and see if I have any left over from the other day. I think like the answer is no. It's not like you said it would be a stack, but the output should be a stack, a yeah. single frame, or, or an ADI with all It is. Stacks. It is. The, the, your, the result that you come back with will be a single frame. And so you'll see, so if you took, say, 50 AVIs during the night, and you look in your 20% folder, there will be 50 TIFFs or 50 PNGs, there, and, you know, depending on what you told it, what kind of frame you told it you wanted. There will be 50 TIFFs or 50 PNGs, which represent, in each one of which represents 20% of those, the, the frames from that AVI, or 20% of frames from the next AVI. So it, you're right, they're, they're single images. So your videos are untouched. They, they still sit there in that folder, but you'll have subfolders in there where all your stacks are already created. So, so the beauty of this is, rather than sitting and manually going through each AVI and setting up each percentage of stacking that you want and having to sit through the entire process while Registax chugs through it, you dump all the frames into AutoStacker at the end of the night and go away and when you come back in the morning, it's got all your stacks already set for you. Yeah. How long does that take with your speed computer? As an so, um, I don't think I've ever seen it take more than an hour. And that's with, you know, say 50 AVIs of wow. one gigabyte each. So it'll, you know, it crunches through this data pretty fast now. So I mean, I say go to bed, but, you know, that's, that's why I wrote go make a sandwich here. You know, you'll, you'll find it'll, it'll crunch through this pretty fast. Yeah. Sorry, uh, what if you're doing the moon and you're doing multiple uh, frames to do a mosaic? So each, it's not that you're shooting the exact same spot on the moon for each AVI, but you're right. shooting a slightly different spot. Um, can you still apply that sort of batch processing? Or yeah, so, so what it'll do is you've, you've created an individual AVI for each of your target points on the moon, right? Right. And then you just dump all those AVIs into AutoStacker and it'll do the same thing. But then the stitching together, of course, you'll have to do that yourself. Well, yeah, that's another program, but it, right. it'll still do well, all the automatic point. Okay, I say that's another program. He's talking about adding that capability into to fire capture. <laughs> I have no idea how you would do that but yeah, he's, he's talking about somehow doing that. And I guess this goes back to the auto-guiding capability. I, and I've, I will say that I asked Torsten, can it actually auto-guide on the moon, or does it only auto-guide on planets? And his answer in short was, I'm not sure. <laughs> so he said, it might, but I haven't really tried it. I tried it out once really briefly during the dawn sky a couple of weeks ago and I couldn't get it to work. But then it was also having trouble auto guiding on Jupiter as the as the sky was brightening up. But, you don't so, have to use but the, the short story is that yeah, yeah, it will do exactly the same thing with the, the, the lunar AVIs 
And then you go through and decide which one represents the best stack from each one of those things and stitch them together. Cool. But it's, it's the same thing with, with Lunar ABIs, yeah. That, that blob guiding might be better for the moon because there's, there's no change in the centroid. I was wondering about that as well. And he, that's what he suggested to try, try blob for, detection rather than center of gravity. Moon. But the other thing, he's already got the stitching together in, this, in the final step of the sub apertures. So he just needs to code it to take separate files instead of the sub files which he creates. Yeah, but what Chris, mm -hmm. what Chris is talking about is, is taking entirely separate videos right. on the moon. I mean, and then you know, overlapping them. I suffered through a 29 frame overlap of Mary Humorum a few years ago and said, I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> I, I do four frame overlaps now. If he's, if he's properly mo modularized what he's already doing in this Jupiter picture, for example, he's divided it up into multiple substacks, which he then at the end puts together in mosaics. Because yes, he that's the, true. So he's got that module. That's in there. true. So he, he could just expand has to have that. A way for you to enter what the in, what your stacks are. Yeah, yeah, that's and he has that's to an idea. Line them up. That's an idea. So there, yeah, I can so see he's probably how got he all could all add the, that capability. He's got the key components in there to do it. Yeah, yeah. Be sure if you add that capability and you use this program, be sure you send him some money. <laughs> but it's, but the other it's, thing, it's amazing that this is freeware. I, I, just, I still can't believe it. The Sorry, is, there was a question over here. I was going to say, the other thing that's a little bit interesting is that if there is a slight amount of rotation during your individual band sequence, because it looks at the middle separately from the edges, it will tend to eliminate that smearing because it will tend to sort of track the middle when yeah. it creates the middle sub-image. Yeah. But it will latch on the edges when it creates the edge sub-images, and then it'll blend them together. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be fascinating to see how this capability gets written in. Sorry. From a workflow perspective, I'm still trying to understand. So if I had five videos that open all five, yeah. then I hit analyze, and it's going to analyze all five, or I have to analyze five separate times? No, it's just once. Just once. You only do the analyze step once. I think what it does is it will actually analyze each one of these individually as it as it comes to each one, but you don't have to. You have no more role in that. But then it, the quality graph, the percentage, it will be different. All five, and it knows which frames on it, which video to go back and get. Yeah, well, it it it, it crunches each video separately. Yeah. So, the so. You've, you're right. You've, you're seeing a quality graph here only yeah. for the first video, right? Only for the first video. Right. That's right. And so then what it's going to do, but you've told it what percentages you want us to stack. Yeah. So when it opens the next video and you're not there, it's going to go through and make a quality judgment on each one of those frames and make a registration judgment on each one of those frames. Okay. It'll take the best ones to create its reference frame okay. and then it'll line up on that reference frame. Okay. So you're never going to see a quality graph for the subsequent ones. And this is, I'm not sure I understand the, the, the technology behind this, the, 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 the math that's going on. Same thing with the alignment on. points, because the alignment points could be different for the other videos, right? Yeah. But in this case, you're just batching this, so you're assuming you're going to be the same. Well, what's going to happen is that AutoStacker is smart enough to know that if in the next frame, that if in the next video that it opens, yeah. Jupiter is slightly to the left or slightly to the right, it, yeah. it'll, it'll know where to put those points. Okay. It also has, um, it also has some feature, I guess, actually I guess it's the same thing, it has some feature that it will automatically crop. Yeah. Amel actually used to have this program that, believe it or not, he called Castrator. <laughs> <laughs> and what it did would be, people had discovered this, that it was, it was, at least with the older stacking software, it was better to have Jupiter in the same position on every frame. Yeah. And so if it wandered the way it's gonna during the night, what Castrator did was it literally would go in and crop the, each frame to, to get you Jupiter in the same spot on each frame, you know, and then create a new ABI for you. This, that function, I think, is actually, he's built it into here, so you, it's all invisible to the user now. All right, so any other questions on, on auto stacker? Yeah, actually, one, one quick one. It's gonna throw out some percentage of the frames. Yeah. But, Right, never mind. Stupid Your raw AVI is still there. Yeah, none of, yeah, none of that I, gets touched. So you can always process this differently later on. I was going to ask, does it tell you what number of frames it ended up keeping? But 
Well, you've, you've told it. Yourself. You've never so when you set your right. percentages up at the top here, you know, you've yeah. told it, throw out you know, the, the, the bottom 90% right. or the bottom 80% or whatever. Yep. Anything else on, on auto stepper? Yeah. Yeah, so say you're running, um, you're doing your acquisition on a Mac with FireWire, and your data's coming in in quick time. Yeah. What's, you know, what's the best way you can get to transfer it over to, to process it on, on auto stacker? Or does it handle that? Or does it need to be an ADM? So this is not real time. This is, you know, once you're done for the night, right here. You're, so and maybe I'm not, I'm not following the question. One's an MOV file and from your Apple and the other right. and you right. want to get it into Can an it API. Can handle that? Or it's going to be, like, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be in a different format. Oh, How oh, you're talking about, so this is a PC program. Yeah. <laughs> and I have no idea. I'm never... Talk, talk to me yeah. after the okay. thing. I, I, I use a Mac and video files from time to time. There's there's a way to do it. Yeah, there, from what a, I've heard, but I yeah, don't there's a tool called Stream Clip that'll rewrap it for you. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Anything else on AutoStacker? Can you show us some examples of what you're doing? Yeah, here. Here's my example right there. So this is these are these are my best images I did for last year, and this was put together with exactly what I'm talking about. It was captured with Fire Capture, and uh, it was stacked with AutoStacker. And then the next step I'm going to show you here is uh, sharpening it up with uh, with Registax. Scope um, used. What's that? Scope used. This is a C11, uh, and these are shot at uh, f32. This Auto. is November second last year. Uh, and that one on the left is probably the, probably the sharpest image of Jupiter that, that, I, that I got last fall. Can you talk about the after the wireless? Yeah, yeah. So I use, I use the C11. I've got, uh, I've got, uh, and, uh, what's, I've got a Taurus Tracker 3, which is a combination flip mirror, off-axis guider uh, behind the scope. Uh, then I've got filter wheel attached to that, and then uh, for, to make it easy to go between deep sky and planetary imaging, I attached my uh, Barlow and my Flea 3 on the back of that. So, and, and it, I will change Barlow's. So right now, I'm only using a 2x Barlow, which is giving me... This was 2x. No, this is 3x. So this, I think the 3x Barlow gives me F32, 34, maybe something like that. Um, because it's not, it's not exactly 3x, because I've got that, that you know, four inch long off axis guider at the back there. Um, uh, and then, you know, depending on how long you, how far you extend back behind the Barlow, you can change that. But right now, uh, and I think, I'm trying to remember what I shot Mars at. I think, I think I shot Mars at F32 also. But right now, with Jupiter being still down, just coming out of the trees, I've, I've been using the 2x Barlow to get about F24. And I shot all my Saturn images this year, because Saturn is so far south now. All my Saturn images were, were with the 2x Barlow at F24. Is but Jupiter's high enough now that I'll switch to the 3x Barlow soon. Is Teleview PowerMate just a fancy name for Barlow, or is there something different about it? Uh, there's something different about it. I've never used the PowerMate, so I use a regular Teleview Barlow. Uh, and I will, I will make one comment on Barlow's that um, I, I have discovered recently that uh, my parfo fo parfocal filters really are parfocal with the Teleview Barlow's. They are not parfocal when I'm doing deep sky imaging with the Celestar on reducer. I mean, they, the, the blue is clearly out of focus. So the quality of your glass you know, determines that answer. And the, the Teleview Barlow's, somebody was thinking when they said, I'm going to design the Barlow this way. There's something that I, I guess there's something about a three element Barlow versus a two element Barlow. So it's worth spending your money on Barlow's if you don't want to bother with refocusing. Oh, that's just seeing. Seeing or, you know, I processed it slightly differently. So yeah, you'll see the, I think you can see on the left-hand image, the, um, I mean, these are, these are actually, these are actually pretty close. The, the planet does change color. Like, there's, there's, there's just more blue in the equatorial zone than there is in the, on the left-hand image than there is on the right-hand image. On the other hand, I'm also a little colorblind. So I'm not the guy to ask, hey, is the color right on that image? Yeah, it's processing. I mean, the, the camera, but it could also be sky conditions. So if the if the transparency went down a little bit, your um, your blue is going to be more effective than your red. 
and if I didn't compensate for that in, in, uh, in processing. And my goal here in processing is to have things look as similar as I can, so I try and stick with the same processing. So if something changed and I didn't compensate for that in processing, that's why you may see different colors. Sorry, you had, you had another question? Yeah, do you have any tips on tuning in your focusing? I know with Deep Sky, you're always focusing on a star, and there's a lot of algorithmic stuff you can use. Software. Right? I, <laughs> no. I mean, you will, um, here, let me go back for just a second. So Fire Capture has this feature called uh, Focus Assist, or is it? Uh, Focus Help. I've never used it. And I think Torsten has kind of confessed that he's not sure how accurate it is just yet. Remember, all this, you know, all this stuff is bleeding edge software. And each capability added to it is the bleeding edge of the bleeding edge. So I, I think what this is doing is it's giving you a quality judgment on each frame that comes along. You can see it's actually generating a little graph here that runs along and, and allows you to compare. And supposedly using that, that will, that will help you reach best focus. My guess is your eyeball is still probably better. But test it out and see. I, haven't, I, I messed with this once a few weeks ago, because uh, it's only been in the software for a few weeks. But you know, test it out and see. And if it, uh, if it, if it works out better for you, then you know, by all means, let us all know. OK, this is one of these things that I mean about how I tell you guys about this stuff in the hopes that somebody will come back and say, hey, there's a better way to do this. You, know, you, you, should, you should test this out. Anybody have anything else about, uh, about AutoStack or we'll go on to uh, Registax? In all of your discussions, you talk about come back and talk to me. Do you have a particular user group you can comment on? The, the Novak list. Just the list? Yeah, okay. yeah just, just post. I mean, I, I, like I spend a lot of time in, the, in Cloudy Nights. They have a solar system imaging group there. Okay. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm there, too. But if you, you know, if you post something about planetary imaging on the Novak list, I'll definitely see it there. Yeah, if you guys, you know, if you're running through this and you run into any questions or you know, want any experience that I've generated, just post on the Novak list and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it there and I will direct you to the people who actually can answer your questions. Um, so the last thing I wanted to cover was uh, uh, sharpening in uh, Registax. The only thing I do anymore with Registax is sharpening. Uh, I will. Once I've generated my, my images in Auto Stafford, I will go through and, and use the, the wavelets function. So this is the, this is the screen in Registax, and you'll see that it has, uh, it has these three tabs at the top. These are the three main feature functions that you go through. Alignment, is, alignment and stacking are what I now do with, uh, with Auto Stafford. Uh, but I still use this wavelet function because there's really nothing quite comparable to it in, uh, in Photoshop. I'll, I'll finish my photos in, in Photoshop and, and take care of some of the defects and stuff like that in, in Photoshop because those, those functions aren't here. But as far as sharpening, and I will do some extra sharpening in Photoshop, but just a tiny bit. Um, almost all the sharpening I do is in this wavelets function in Registax. So um, I've, I've, uh, in this slide, I've set out you know, the, the, the settings that you should use here to start this. But the truth is, figuring out what sharpening level to use in Registax is kind of a matter of just messing with it and seeing what you get. I can, I'll go back to the slide in a minute here, um, which is why I call it the mystery of wavelets, because A, I have no idea what wavelets really are. It has something to do with, and, and the reason there are a bunch of different sliders down here, there are, what, six different sliders, it has something to do with the, the Slider number one is dealing with sharpening up the, the finest features in the frame. And slider number six is the coarsest features in the frame. But other than that, I've had people, to, people tell me to go into this, this function wavelet filter, which actually gets into the whole algorithm, the engine, resetting the parameters. Yeah, <laughs> I've never tried to do any of that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, what I can tell you is what I've written here, that uh, start out with this first slider. This is going to sharpen up the, 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 the smallest features in the image. And in general, you know, that's what you're going for, a high resolution image. So you want to have the small features be sharp, right? Because if the small features are all sharp, well, then the big features are going to be sharp by themselves, right? 
So what I do is I start off with this first slider here. There are three, each of these different levels, this is, you see this layer number one here. So it's the, this is the finest features. Each of these has three different features. The first one you want to mess with is the slider. And so you grab this and you slide it to the right and you'll see that that'll start sharpening up your image here. Um, what I do is I usually slide it out to about the 50% and, and you get a reading here on where it is. What I do is slide it out to the 50% point here uh, and then take a look at what I've got. And then the next step is you use this denoise function. So you've taken your first slider, you sh slid it out here, and you've seen that the, the planet will sharpen up noticeably just, just by doing that. Uh, but it'll also be very noisy. And so Regis Regisx has this denoise feature that they added in in the last release. And by adjusting the, I guess this is called a spin dial, by adjusting the, the spin dial here, you increase or decrease the, the, the denoise settings. And what you'll usually see is there's kind of a magic number that you come to where you, you pop it up and all of a sudden the noise diminishes markedly. That's the denoise setting that you want. You, what I usually do at that point is I will go back and I will mess again with the slider, push the slider up a little bit higher, add a little bit more denoising to it until I get to a sharpness that I think I can, is, is what I'm really shooting for. But there's a third feature here, which you will also see is called sharpen. So you may ask yourself, if the slider is sharpening the picture, what is the sharpen dial doing? <laughs> and the truth is, I don't really know why they call them both sharpen. I mean, yes, when you mess with this and increase it, you will see that it will sharpen somewhat. But what you'll also see is that it, it makes the features a little bit more coarse. So I think what the spin dial for sharpening is doing is it's kind of moving you to midway to the next layer. So in theory, you're sharpening up only the finest features here. But once you start messing with this sharpened spin dial, you're messing with, you know, rather than going straight from layer one to layer two, you're like, you know, now we're with layer 1.1 or 1.2 or something like that. Is the slider not the intensity of the denoise and the sharpening? The right. only, only the denoise uh, uh, spin dial will cover denoise. And there's actually a spe special algorithm that Registax uses for that. But the slider itself? It's just sharpening. Sharpening, but based on the sharpened parameter and the denoise parameter? In theory, it's not. It's based on. It is based to some extent. It's based on the sharpen parameter. Yeah. So the slider is the intensity value of the denoise and sharpen parameter. Yeah, the denoise is actually a separate function separate that, that function. comes in afterward. Okay. Um, huh. Core the core Darvitz, the, the the guy who wrote Regstacks, has yeah. tried to explain it many times, but. I imagine it's kind of like relativity. There are probably like 10 people in the world who actually understand what it does. What I know is I mess with it until it seems right. Um, the, but the, the short story is that for each one of these levels, each one of these layers that you mess with, denoise is the last thing that you want to do. So get it to the sharpening that you want, and then you know, use the denoise. Try maybe sharpen it up a little bit more, but then denoising is usually the last thing that you'll do. There's something, he, he's tried to explain this as, there's some, there's some way that this denoising function, if you, the reason you see a sudden change between you know, too little denoising and the right amount is because it somehow, it, it does tie in somehow with the sharpened features and it traps the noise in that layer. And I don't exactly know what that means, but I do know that you know you do see all of a sudden that you know the noise markedly decreases, and are that's they, how you know you're at the right level. Are the layers similar to Photoshop layers? No, no. The layer here means the way Core has described it is layer. The 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 wavelet filter is somehow looking at coarseness of features. So slider one, the wavelet filter is, is somehow looking down at you know, very fine features. Okay. 
And there, you know, there, there are some sort of sharpening algorithms that, that it runs through, the, the same way that, that Photoshop uses unsharp masking, you know, blurs it first, then sharpens it, and figures out what to do. The wavelet filter is doing the same thing. It's much, much more advanced than, than what you'll find in Photoshop, which is why I do almost all of my sharpening in Registax now. Um, so the, 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 what I've done is I've told you the settings you want to use here, um, linear, Gaussian, and use linked wavelets. Honestly, again, this is another one of those areas that if you were like an advanced imaging processing guy, you would probably know what those things mean. I know what they do when I click them, and <laughs> everybody that I know basically uses those three settings. But exactly what they're doing? Well, I don't know. Uh, can, uh, I have a question. Can sharpen and denoise have negative values? Uh, yeah, they can. I've never, I've messed with them a little bit down there, <coughs> I, I but I, I have never actually, I've never actually found any value in going there. But yeah, you can definitely do that, and I've heard some people have tried that. One of the things which I think happens in the higher order levels is you'll tend to reduce the limb darkening of the overall planet. You'll tend to flatten the whole thing. Because I could that, see that, that very broad change in brightness. Yeah. If you put a negative sharpening on that, instead of making it worse, it will make it less. Yeah. And if you want to eliminate limb darkening, I think a negative value, and I don't know if it's a level five or six, or maybe it's in another level which they don't even give you. But that's the kind of thing that's it's whether you're accentuating or minimizing in the high numbered levels very slow changes across the image versus in level one, it's the highest. It's That's what it's edges. doing, yeah. It's looking at edges, basically. Yeah. The other thing that happens is if you have a, if you have sort of a fuzzy image of, of Jupiter, it may be that increasing the sharpening at level one does absolutely no good at all because there's nothing to be sharpened. And it's just sharpening the noise. So but maybe you're better off sharpening level two. So what I have found is that I, I usually only use layer uh, on the best imaging I or the best images I usually only use layer one. Sometimes I will go to, to layer two, but usually not on the best. But what I also find is this this sharpen dial, and this is where I was going next. What you really see with this 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 sharpen dial, it the the main effect that I see that it has is that it increases contrast. And again, you know, it's applying a sharpening function, and that's why you see that, which is getting into, into what you're talking about. But th what I really use it for is when I do have a, a, a fairly poor image, I find that sometimes by increasing the sharpening level, I can actually tweak a, a significantly better image out of it. Now, it's never going to be as good as if I actually shot it in good seeing. But the difference sometimes when, when I mess with the sharpening level can really be noticeable. So it's, it's actually very valuable to use that in, in poor seeing. But I've also discovered in good seeing, like the, the thing that I noticed about this, this image of Jupiter that I took, I used almost no sharpening on that at all. Because when I applied my standard sharpening levels to it, it just like completely overprocessed. And I went back and the, the levels that I was using on that were, I was using the default sharpen level here, which is 0 0.10. And I had, I, I did, I do use the sliders. And the sliders, the sliders I find if you have good seeing, the, the, the sliders put up with that very well. Uh, and you know, as long as you denoise at the right level. But I found these sharpen functions, I wasn't using those at all in the best seeing. In, in average seeing, I'll usually use 0 0.11 here and 0 0.10. In other words, no extra sharpening down here. But yeah, I have found that that sometimes I can, I can cheat in you know in less than optimal seeing and use that sharpen dial, and I can get a I can get a fairly good result out of it. But again, you know, my, my real experience with what that actual sharpen dial is is what, what it's actually doing is it increases the contrast in your image, and I think that's why in, in poor seeing you're not really going to get much in terms of contrast, and that's why sometimes in you know in less than optimal seeing you will work out better by by messing with that sharpen dial a little bit. So that's why I've written here that the, the sharpness dial controls contrast, but you know, definitely it also affects sharpness as well. But again, like I said, the, the short story for, for using sliders and or using sharpening in, in uh, RegSax is to mess with it and to come across what looks good to you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about, just very briefly, about a couple of the other features that I use in RegSax. 
Uh, and what I've mentioned before, it's see this view compare feature here? What happens when you, when you click on that is it, it pops up two boxes here. The one is the, the image that you've got displayed right now with the settings that you're using. But what you can do then is you can go back and select another image or you can, well, let me, one step at a time. The first thing you can do is you can compare images, compare different settings on the wavelets. So you've got the top box, which is showing your current settings, and then in the bottom box below it, it'll show you the planet. You can mess with the settings, and it'll show you side by side what the planet looks like. Um, I, I do do that until I'm satisfied with my, my, my sharpening levels. But the real thing, the real advantage of this view compare feature is that Remember how AutoStacker created you know, 20% stack, a 40% stack, a 60% stack? What I can do with View Compare is I can go back, hit the Select button, and I can open up one of those other images. And now, in those comparison boxes, I've got my 20% image with these sharpening levels, and I've got my 40% image with these sharpening levels. And that'll pretty quickly tell me you know, whether I should use the 20% stack for the, from that set or the 40% stack or the 60% stack. So I can run through them real quick. The real advantage, though, is I told you I shoot a ton of AVIs during the night, particularly now that Fire Capture will you know, automate this whole process for me. So I might shoot an AVI every 10 minutes or even, even closer than that. And then what I can do is because AutoStacker has gone through and processed all the, all the images for me and created a stack, I can go, say, to my, you know, my 1.30 a.m. image and compare the red frame from that to the red frame from my 1.40 a.m. image. And using that, I can determine, you know, okay, it's this set of AVIs that I want to process, the others are junk, I can just let those go. And that saves me a lot of time because, you know, after this, you've got to sharpen each one of these through Registax, and then you go back and in Photoshop, and you mess around in Photoshop to get your final image. And if you already know that the final image is going to be junk, then there's really no point in continuing to process those AVIs, and you've just saved yourself a lot of time. So, the, the, you know, I don't use a lot of these features, but that view compare button, I use that every single time. Uh, the other one that I, oh yeah, sorry, one thing about this, when you're using view compare, you want to make sure that you use the same wavelet settings, because otherwise if you open a new image, these wavelet settings will all pop back to neutral. So that, uh, when, I'm, when I'm trying to decide which ABI is the best one and which one is worth processing, I want to make sure that I'm applying the same wavelets to it, because otherwise I'm not comparing apples to apples. So make sure that you have whole wavelet setting checked. But as long as you have that, then you, know, you can quickly go through your ABIs and figure out what is worth processing and what, what do I need to just jump. Um, some of these other tools, you can see that there's a whole bunch of other tools here. Uh, the histogram tool is kind of like applying levels in Photoshop. Gamma is very much like applying curves in Photoshop. Um, I have Photoshop, so I don't, I don't use these tools in Registax anymore. Uh, <clears throat> End of the line. Uh, so what we've talked about here is capturing your images in Fire Capture and the degree to which you can now automate that process and you know, go inside and resume your life separate from astronomy for a little while. Um, AutoStacker then, you just dump all your, all your captured videos into AutoStacker and it handles all the stacking process for you. That's all taken <coughs> care of now. And then sharpen each one up in, in uh, reg stacks, decide which ones you want to continue uh, further processing on, and then carry those through uh, into Photoshop, where you will want somebody else to, to, to tell you what to do. Um, the, if anybody didn't get it, there's a handout here, which is this slide here, that has links to all these, uh, uh, all the software, and also a link to this uh, PowerPoint presentation online. And again, if anybody tries any of those links, particularly my link, and finds that it doesn't work, just post it on the Novak list, uh, or post it in the solar system, uh, Cloudy Nights uh, solar system imaging forum, and I'll see it there, and I'll, I'll fix it and make sure uh, everybody can get it. We'll also put it up on the HSP site. Okay, that's, that's very good, thank you. Here's another question, getting into Registax, a frame which is, is the select button on the upper left. Yeah, if you, 
So Registax is expecting you to go in there with your AVIs, right, and, and crunch them all. If you just have a single frame, um, when, when you open up Registax and you hit the select button and you open up one frame, it'll jump straight to the wavelets page because there's nothing else you can do with it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Do you know if uh, Fire Capture has uh, drivers for still cameras operating within kilometers? Sorry, if it has drivers for still well, cameras operating within kilometers? I'm a lawyer. Yeah. Well, uh, not <laughs> ABI cameras, just still cameras. Um, yeah, I don't think I don't think I have the list here. I mean, I can show you when you when you first open up, it actually gives you a list of the uh, the programs that it will work with, and uh, or the the cameras that it will work with. He's added new cameras as he's gone on, but um, I don't think that uh, there's anything too far afield at this point just yet. Let me see what he shows us here. It's a different class of unit <coughs> than from the video. Right. So this is the list. And you'll see down at the bottom here, he's got, uh, he's got webcam listed, uh, which I know means that it, it will work with the 2U cam uh, to a certain extent. But like I said, I'm not sure exactly how much. <coughs> but these are the other cameras that have, uh, uh, have drivers that will run direct from, uh, from fire capture. But other than that, I mean, if you get too far off the beaten track, uh, you're probably on your own. If you want to do uh, solar system imaging with a DSLR, for example, mm -hmm. Backyard EOS uh, is an excellent program um, for either deep sky or planetary imaging. It, it yeah. Do a lot of the sort of AVI management uh, features that um, Fire Capture does as well. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people say that Backyard EOS is very good for that, yeah. Have you done anything with Rinas and Neptune? Um, I have take, I've never, never bothered to capture Neptune. Um, so if I'm, if I'm capturing either Uranus or Neptune, I'm going after the moons. And I have uh, tried that uh, a few times with my deep sky camera. And I've, I've definitely caught, caught moons of Uranus, which is pretty cool. But I've never really gone back to the trouble of trying to then take uh, an actual image with it, uh, you know, a planetary disk image, and then marry that up to the to the moon images. I've been so far. I've been at the point of like, oh, that's really cool, but not to the point of like, oh, I should create a really displayable image for uh, for that. But it is neat to to track down these moons. One of these days, I'm going to track down Triton. But I've never uh, never really gone to the trouble of doing that yet. Anybody have anything else? Any suggestions or comments on chip size in terms of the DMK cameras? Quarter um, inch versus half inch versus... So the, the smaller chips are going to give you faster frame rates. Now, it may be that using the region of interest feature in fire capture, you can goose those frame rates, but I don't think so. Because I, I think that the region of interest thing is only taking place in your laptop, determining how much of it gets written to the drive. So the, the DMKs are, see the Flea 3 is FireWire. So the, the DMK um, is USB 2, and at least with my setup, would top out at about 60, 70 frames per second. Yeah, nice at, at a 640 by 480 chip. So if you're going to a larger chip, you're going to suffer a lot less putting, putting your lunar mosaics together, because <laughs> you'll get you know, 1280 instead of 640. Planetary small size chip is fine. Planetary imaging small size chip is what you want. You want high frame rates, and small chip means high frame rates. Yeah. You got to filter real monochrome for best. How's that? is better than a color chip. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, the the difference between uh, when you get to these high speed cameras, the difference between color and monochrome gets narrower uh, than I think with the the DMKs, um, but there's still definitely different. It's, you, you still will you will you will come out ahead with, with monochrome imaging, and the truth is that because fire capture automates this process for you, and auto stacker it stacks all your AVIs for you regardless of what color they are. The only extra step that I wind up doing is in Registax I have to sharpen up each one individually, but I, I always apply the same sharpening of settings in Registax to each color, because if you don't. 
you will wind up with a bizarre color of Jupiter or Mars. I, I, I tried that a few years ago, and I found that for your wavelet settings, you have to apply the same sharpening. The one thing that you can get away with is, because your blue frame will be crappy, you can actually apply a little bit more denoising to blue than to the other colors. So you can mess with denoising, but as far as the sliders and the sharpen setting, use the same one, otherwise it's going to look really weird. And once you do that, you find that the only actual extra step, other than, okay, i got to open each still frame, apply the settings, save, open, apply the settings, save. So you have to do that, but the only extra step that you have is you do the R RGB merge in Photoshop. But again, I find that, that that's, uh, that's you know, it's, it's very easy. This, so you know, this, this all adds just a couple of minutes to the process for me these days. What's that? Yeah, I do the RGB merge in Photoshop. If there's, if there's a way to do it somewhere else, I don't, I don't actually know what it is. Um, I guess there, there used to be some ways to do it, but I, I never quite found out how. Do you have to align your different color frames to each other? I used to have to do that, but either Fire Capture or Auto Stacker or both are doing something now that I always check it, but I almost never have to tweak it at all. So it has something to do with this. I, I assume that it's auto stacker. It has something to do with the, this fact that this castrator function is now built into auto stacker, that the frames are already aligned. But I don't understand how that works, because the red AVI is a different AVI than the green and blue AVIs. So how is it doing that? I assume the answer is because it's centering the planet on, on each of its final frames. So when I run through AutoStacker, if I'm feeding a 640 by 480 video into it, I find that that's not what's coming out of it. That's not the frame that I get out. So it's got to be in there somewhere. So yeah, that, that was another, another kind of a hassle of doing RGB uh, uh, merges in Photoshop that I then had to go back and align each one of them. But I find that I really don't have to do that anymore. Another automation step taken care of. This is sort of a, a trivia thing, but it may be that it works well at opposition, but as Jupiter gets away from opposition, one of the things that unfortunately happens with the atmosphere is the centroid of brightness changes in different colors because the sun's coming in sort of from the side, yeah. and it's a measurable difference. So it may not centroid the RGB as well, but obviously you always don't want to take Jupiter near opposition to make it as large as possible in the, yeah. in the sky. So it may not be a big practical problem. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's probably true that as it sent, as as in each individual band, it centers the image. It does it so well that you put them all together, they line up. Yeah. yeah it's, it does make life easier. Um, there's one extra thing that I want to tell you guys about that I decided not to put into the presentation, but I've started to tinker with it over the last few months, and, and I'm finding that it does make a difference. We talked about how the fact that you're, you're limited in how much, how much time you can take for any planet. Jupiter rotates fast, so you really, if you're getting sharp images, you're really limited to one minute, uh, one minute AVIs. Um, because if you, if you try and run for two or three or four minutes, Jupiter's going to rotate, and you're going to wind up with a smeared image once you get that final image out of it. However, um, you guys may have heard of a program called WinJupos. And what it was really intended for was to create uh, was to create maps of the planet. I can show you that map that I created here. Um, this is what it was really designed for. Yes, yes, we don't there. Um, uh, was for mapping, which is really cool. Um, so this is this is these are all my 2011 images set up as an animation that I created with WinJupos. And this is what WinJupus was really designed for. What you do is you, you feed each individual picture into it, and it creates a strip map for you. And here, what I've done is I've created four strip maps and animated them. So this is last fall from, I think, August, well, September through December. But one of the other things that WinJupus does now is it's added in what's called a derotation feature. And so you can take, I've taken videos up to five minutes long, and I don't know how it does this, but WinJupos, you will feed your AVI into WinJupos, and it looks at each individual frame, and it knows how far into the AVI it is, 
and it will somehow do a, a spherical derotate and create a new frame for you and create a new AVI for you. And then you take those derotated AVIs and feed them through AutoStacker. And now suddenly, instead of being limited to one minute of exposure time, you can run you know, five minutes of exposure time. And the result is you get five times as many frames for AutoStacker to pick your best ones from. And just like going to the Flea 3 to get high frame rates and a lot of frames for AutoStacker to choose from was a big step, this promises to be the next wave of derotation. And I tried it on Saturn, and I have found it definitely made a difference on my Saturn images. I mean, some Saturn would have been really poor this season because it's so far south. Um, but I found that I was able to get some pretty good uh, images out of Saturn by applying derotation. And I compared them to images taken the conventional way, and it really makes a difference. I've uh, barely even begun messing with it on Jupiter, because Jupiter is just above the trees for me. But I am eager to try it out. So it's, it's something to keep in the back of your, your minds that a year from now, you, know, you will probably be seeing that everybody, all these super advanced images that you're seeing posted on the web are probably being crunched through WinJupos as this extra step. How is it spelled? How's it what? Spelled? Win, it's Win yeah. Jupos, J-U-P-O-S. Yeah. So it's a cool program just, just for this purpose alone. But uh, when uh, the guy who wrote it, again, freeware, uh, our, our, when the guy who wrote it added in this derotation feature, you know, all of a sudden it went from being a really cool tool to produce maps with for doing measurements to an image processing tool. So I, I have I have suggested gently to the guy who uh, to Emil, the guy who produced AutoStacker, that he should get together with Torsten, who wrote Fire Capture, and Grisha Han, the guy who wrote WinJupos, and crunch this all into one program that uh, you can simply uh, you know, <laughs> feed your data into it and say, you know, prepare this for me and I'll see you in the morning, okay? <laughs> I, I, I told him that uh, world domination was merely a step away for, for them, uh, and he has not taken me up on it yet. But uh, maybe one of these days, these, these guys will get together and uh, produce the, the awesome all-in-one planetary imaging package for you. Would you, would you both only works on Jupiter, or can you use it on Saturn? It works on Jupiter and Saturn. Does not, for reasons I do not understand, does not work on Mars. Um, Grisha, again, explained to me why it doesn't work on Mars, and I'm sure that, Good that was, it was an excellent explanation, yes, but I'm a lawyer. And uh, it's, uh, there is some reason that it doesn't work on Mars. But, but again, it seems like you know, it's the kind of feature that probably could be written into it. And given that Mars is gone for the next 18 months or so anyway, there's plenty of time for this to get written into the next release, right? And hopefully there will be plenty of time there for these three guys to get together and dominate the world with their, their new uh, advanced imaging package. All right, well, thanks for, uh, thanks for being so patient. And again, anybody has any questions, you know, post online, and I will do anything I can to answer them. Okay, and, and look for the, the presentation on uh, the, the website.